First of all, let me welcome all the honored guests that are coming here today with us back again as last year uh, in the previous edition. And I'm honored uh, that my country is still hosting uh, this fantastic event. And let me, first of all, introduce to you somebody who really wouldn't need any introduction, Dr. Mubar Afeyan, uh, co-founder of the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, co-founder and chairman of Moderna, and founder and CEO of Flagish Pioneering. Uh, and Ricardo Clerici here is on my left, who is a senior government liaison officer at the UNHCR. Uh, a United Nations agency that you probably know very well uh, because it dedicates uh, all its efforts to save lives, to uh, help uh, defending rights, and also uh, helping supporting displaced people, families, uh, people who have not citizenship, who are stateless. Um, so last night, uh, the Aurora Prize ceremony was very uh, emotional, amazing, with the high moments. And of course, we want to thank you, the, uh, this year laureate, Jamila Afghani. Uh, she's not here today, unfortunately, but thanks for your courage, your outstanding work. And this meeting today is also unique because it gives us a chance to uh, have a direct line with uh, Dr. Nubara Fayyan, uh, the Aurora co-founder, and um, gain a deeper understanding of what Aurora's approach and also the impact they want to have in the world. And as you probably know, uh, Aurora is proceeding uh, with the award split this year uh, and has teamed up with the UNHCR uh, to help the people of Yemen. Um, we are happy to have their representative here today um, to explore and to understand better which is this kind of cooperation. Um, so first, uh, first question for Nubara Fayyan, um, which is the importance for Aurora of this new approach, this development, let's talk like this, and uh, what is also the big difference? Great, thank you Marina, thanks for joining us today and thanks to everybody. Um, so, just a little bit of uh, background, Aurora's history is not that long, especially in a room like this where the word history means a very different thing. But in our history of six years, um, we have uh, traditionally uh, had the million dollar prize uh, be directed at up to three different foundations that the laureate selects. So over the last uh, years, uh, there's been some six million plus directed at different initiatives. Um, and that, that has served us well. We've reached um, basically uh, 20 different countries, different organizations, and we've seen the results, lots of impact on the ground. And that, so that was going just fine. In 2020, uh, quite unexpectedly, let's say, for those of us who founded the project, um, the, the very country uh, on whose history this was based, which is Armenia, uh, underwent its own humanitarian crisis in the form of a war that happened in a, in a neighboring enclave of Armenians. And that created a big humanitarian crisis. And it was an awkward situation because we realized that there, were real, there was real suffering going on. Here we were, were you know, identifying projects from all over the world, but had essentially not thought about these urgent crises that, that arise. So in 2021, for the first time, uh, Aurora, the selection committee, as well as with the laureate, we decided that we should identify a current crisis, in this case it was in Artsakh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, to bring humanitarian assistance as part of the mission uh, in order to connect both the projects that are important with the laureate, but also a universal kind of current crisis. And the results were actually quite important, significant, uh, and so we decided to continue that. So this year, for the first time, we did something we had never tried before, which is to really leverage the group of uh, previous laureates, previous humanitarians, as a brain trust of sorts. And we reached out to them, and we said, look, we're going to dedicate, as part of the Aurora plan, uh, $300,000 to a current humanitarian 
crisis, what would you advise us to do? And that was a very interesting uh, process because they, we solicited from them both in, by voting as well as by their words what they thought the real need was. And that gave us a real perspective of many, many crises. You could imagine they could have said Ukraine, that's a big crisis going on, humanitarian as well. You could imagine they would say Afghanistan, and some did. But the overwhelming response we got from somewhat some 30 people uh, uh, of different, these are all laureates and humanitarians that have been in our community in the last few years, was Yemen. And the rationale that was given was that when it comes to trying to have impact, there's three things we should consider. One is how uh, large the crisis is. Uh, the other is how, how much the need is for intervention, but importantly, how urgent it is and how overlooked it is. And in the last category, that is an overlooked crisis where the, the resources of the world have not been adequately directed and the attention to that challenge, uh, Yemen was the, the most uh, uh, overlooked in their views uh, situation. So we decided that we should have that, the, the group then, uh, with Tom Katena as the, as the lead of that group, decided that that should be the choice. And our hope is that this will be a way for Aurora to channel the, the, the experience of the past, the genocide and what led to the actual prize itself, to the present and the acute urgent needs, and then to the impact we can have on the future. And that's the, that's the way we've thought about it. And, and we have a lot more to learn, but Yemen will be the first of these things. Uh, and we expect, again, like we said last night many times, we hope that next year or the year after, there is no urgent, acute, overlooked crisis, but unfortunately there probably will be, and we want this community, this project, and by the way, the resources that, that we're deploying are only a part of the overall resource base that we're able to attract once we're focusing on an area, so we think this can also be a vehicle for other organizations to join us. And I should say finally that we're very happy to, to work with the UNHCR colleagues, and we hope to grow that relationship because they're already doing this work, and if we can be part of their network, uh, we think that could be a very positive thing. So that, that, that's the kind of logic behind it and what our expectations are. Thank you, Anubar. This is definitely a great initiative. Um, and you know, you know, you're right, uh, because uh, it's important to address the urgent needs uh, as Yemen represents, but also thinking about the future of a country like Yemen is a never bigger challenge. Uh, for us. Um, and another thing which is very important that Aurora always did is to empower local leaders to highlight their job, to spread their job to the, the entire world. And these leaders, uh, the, the, the laureates, but the, also the finalists, all the humanitarians, uh, they are right exactly the kind of leaders that the world really needs today. And we want to hear from them. This is what the, it's the new approach of Aurora, hear from the local leaders. Um, and this new approach is really engaging, really interesting. We are finding other ways to involve local leaders. Uh, and so talking about Yemen, which is a country, yeah, uh, one of the most overlooked crises uh, on which the UNHCR has always worked. Uh, so I want to ask Ricardo Clerici, uh, which are the factors that make the uh, crisis in Yemen so acute and so difficult to address? Thank you, Marina. Good morning, everyone, uh, colleagues. Uh, and after yesterday evening ceremony, I must say friends, uh, it was really a pleasure to be with you, honor uh, to represent UNHCR and our High Commissioner, Filippo Grandi, who could not participate in person. Um, Indeed, I mean, the criteria that uh, Mr. Afeyan mentioned, especially the, the fact of being overlooked, uh, is extremely correct for Yemen. And I thank the laureates who fought about Yemen as the most, one of the most overlooked crises. Uh, how certain crises go overlooked, uh, that's a big question. We don't have the time to delve into that. But let's consider that this year, in 2022, the number of displaced persons, I know that you are familiar with this, reached the staggering number of 100 million. That is double what it used to be 10 years ago. 
So we are looking at the very, very negative trend of displacement in the world. And uh, Yemen is one of the most complex humanitarian and protection uh, crises. It's also a litmus test of what many of these crises do represent today in the global world. Because we have, as a main trigger and cause, a conflict, a devastating conflict. And I don't go into the details. I think our humanitarian, uh, Hadi Jaman, could speak better than me about the conflict. Just to mention, I was reading, reviewing the documents. I mean, the number of children victims, 70% UN estimates below age of five of the all civilian victims and children use also as soldiers. So this is just give you a glimpse of the atrocity, the bombings uh, committed over the years. What else we have? We have uh, climate change that is impacting the region and Yemen as well. Uh, we are looking at one of the most serious famine coming. Um, we are looking most recently in the, sp in the spike of prices, which affect Yemen, also our operation in Yemen, uh, fuel, uh, energy, um, and therefore we are looking at the dire humanitarian situation, food, water, uh, and uh, shelter. About the conflict, by the way, we hope that we come from six months of truce, of relatively peace. Uh, I don't think it has been extended yet, but we hope that this will uh, continue. So what, is the, what are the numbers, the highlights of this horrible crisis? 24 million of people, 80% uh, of the population below poverty lines. That means really, I mean, it's uh, rhetoric to say do not make hands meet, but we are talking about all areas of daily living, food, water, sanitation, health, uh, uh, disrupted. In addition to that, and as part of this population, we have what are, I would say, the person of our direct concern, the internally displaced person. The la one of the largest displaced population now in the world is in Yemen. We're talking about 4.3 million persons scattered throughout the countries. We don't have big refugee camps in Yemen, uh, but that gives you a little bit of a sense of how big is number. Uh, Mr. Afeyan mentioned also how large the crisis is. It? Well, it's very large. It's very large. It's just a little below uh, Ukraine at the moment. And what is the profile of this population, which makes it so dramatic and complicated also to address the needs. First of all, we're talking about 50% children and 30% women. So a very fragile group. The commissioner came to Rome a few weeks ago. We had some events at the Vatican. And speaking with the secretariat, we learned that among the concern of the Holy Father, the children of Yemen is at the top. So victims of a conflict, actors of a conflict as soldiers, and part of his uh, population. And the other aspect of the profile is vulnerability. You know, you, you, you work in this field, vulnerability can mean a lot, but I was amazed by reading uh, that 90% of the households of these IDPs do have very high vulnerability indicators. I'm talking about chronic or very serious medical condition, disabilities, person at risk, you know, the elderly. So this is a very fragile population that we are trying uh, to address. And what is UNHCR trying to do with the international community and with local partners? I do um, enjoy a lot the reference to local partners. This is the, the, the way UNHCR does business in humanitarian crisis. We have more than 20 partners in Yemen. Well, UNHCR is, I'm going a little bit into the jargon, UN jargon, is leading three clusters, protection, uh, camp management, shelter, and non-food items, which means a long list of activities, legal assistance, psychological support, uh, identification of person with specific need, referral, there is a huge problem of trafficking, sex slaves uh, also, also in the area, in the region, so many things. Shelter is huge, with so many people obliged to leave their homes, uh, with local materials, trying to be their environmental friendly. But one point that I want to highlight in our program is cash assistance, which seems, you know, humanitarian cash. No, cash is the way to empower, to let refugees and IDPs to prioritize themselves, what are their needs. Unfortunately, cash is so limited, given the needs, that 90% 
of the IDP spend this money on food. And even by spending that on food, now with uh, rising prices, there is a survey we just conducted, and it's, I, I always, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked by, you read these sentences, quality of food that goes down, how many meals per day, whether you need to give a meal to the elderly or the children and renounce yourself. These are the questions, the daily choices that these people, that refugees have to do. I'm coming to an end to connect a little bit with the Aurora initiative. Uh, this donation is important because uh, I make a long story short, short the world, private and public donors, were very generous with Ukraine. Very good. But UNHCR global budget, which reached 10 billion, did not increase. So there are a number of emergencies. You picked one of the most important ones, but we came out with a report of 12, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan or Sudan, where our budgets are underfunded, double than it was last year. So we really, uh, we are facing a lot of challenges to meet the needs of the person we serve. So nobody should be left behind, the people of Yemen, the refugees in Yemen, because I forgot to mention that in Yemen there are also 100,000 refugees, so mainly Somali and Ethiopians who live in the most horrible condition in the suburbs of Haden and Sana'a. And just to give you an example of who is shouldering the border, Italy's global refugee population is 200,000. Yemen, by itself, 100,000. So, coming to an end, we are very grateful at UNHCR uh, to all of you, to the Aurora community mm -hmm. for this donation. We will do our best to deliver and to try to bring that hope and dignity for these people. And let me say, after yesterday evening, I will try to convey to my colleagues and to the High Commissioner the spirit of initiative to deliver what we do on a daily basis. I know we already do it, but with a sense of gratitude in action that is at the core of the initiative. But we are very thankful and I'm very honored to be here with you today. Thanks. Many thanks to Riccardo Clerici for his presentation. And now, one step more to understand better the approach of Aurora. Uh, Aurora has always honored the, the saviors of the past by supporting uh, those who uh, help people today, uh, the heroes of today. And uh, Nubara Fayan has talked about this topic in details recently at the uh, Clinton Global Initiative event in New York, moderated by Hillary Clinton, former uh, United States Secretary of State. And so we want to uh, enjoy this video to understand more about the Aurora approach. We should be ready. <laughs> is the founder and chief executive officer of something called Flagship Pioneering, but more to the point for us, he's the co-founder and chairman of Moderna, which produced a vaccine in record time. And coincidentally, you also started the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity in 2016. Can you tell us what was the inspiration for that prize and how did your uh, experience uh, as, a, as a refugee and knowledge about refugees impact um, your deciding to do that? Well, thank you. Thanks for, for the uh, in involvement here today. Um, so um, I'm, I, I moved from Lebanon during the Civil War, escaped with my family, and, and the country of Canada was kind enough to accept us basically overnight back in 1975. But going back 80 years before that, uh, I'm a descendant of survivors of the Armenian Genocide. And that, uh, a century ago, the same types of things were happening in this region as they are today, unfortunately. And so on the centennial of the Armenian Genocide, which was in 2015, um, several of us, Vartan, the late Vartan Gregorian, my close colleague who helped us found this prize, the Aurora Prize, we started wondering, what do you do 100 years later to mark an event of that tragedy? 
And it occurred to us that the, we talk a lot about the, the lives that were saved. So there are, so, so, so there's clearly survivors, but then there were also s saviors. And these saviors have gone into anonymity you know, for a century after that. And so we thought, okay, well, we can't bring them back to life to honor them, but why not instead go find the saviors who are alive today in various conflict regions around the world and honor them and bring resources to their work. And so that's really what the Aurora Prize is all about. It's an annual prize plus a number of other humanitarian assistance programs that's been running now for eight years. And we have, I mean, unfortunately, there, are, there, there should be no need for a prize like this in a, in a modern world. Uh, there's the famous saying, you know, cursed is the land that needs heroes. And unfortunately, we have the need for heroes. And so over the years, whether it's conflict zones in Burundi, in Rwanda, or in more recently in Myanmar or in uh, DRC, in every one of these regions, there are dozens and dozens of worthy candidates of which one and out of a group is selected. So that's been our mechanism to create a cycle of giving back and allowing new saviors to create new survivors who can then get back on their feet and continue this journey. That's really what this whole thing's about. Well, it's also very inspirational to highlight people who often at the risk of their own life or their own standing in the community, their uh, acceptance by others, go out of their way, go out of their comfort zone. Uh, to help, and uh, I, I think it is important to highlight, you know, that kind of courage. Uh, and do you want to give us just one example of someone that really sticks in your mind who, who got the prize? Uh, sure. I mean, it, it was kind of one of the one of the folks who's actually gone on to help us a lot with this prize is was a former college football player from the U.S. who went to Brown University, and then after school he basically devoted his life to Catholic mission went to uh, Sudan and essentially ended up being the only doctor in the Nuba Mountains to over 60,000 people for many years during a conflict zone. And the actual lives he saved and, and the community enabled to literally just survive under terrible conditions and continues to. He's there now that he is their savior for sure. And he's treated as that very humble, very, very uh, a kind of devoted person. The interesting thing is though that uh, uh, Tom Katina, who's his name, had no idea that there are many other people like him because he has no means of meeting them. So another interesting thing that's happened is there's now a growing community of these folks that are very similar in their kind of value system, but happen to be living in northern Iraq. or in, So that, that creation of a community it gives them strength. These are folks who don't have people helping them write grants to foundations to be able to get resources. So this is kind of the most frontline people. So we've learned a lot from them. It, regardless of what you've done in your life, you meet folks like this and it's a very humbling experience and it's an inspiration. Oh, that's exciting. Nubar, you are a kind of serial entrepreneur yourself. I mean, you've done uh, a series of incredible business opportunities, but you too believe in giving others, giving other people the tools and the opportunities that they need to be self-reliant. Um, so what is your thinking about how entrepreneurship, how businesses uh, can do more in this country as well as around the world? Um, to try to see the value in refugees and, and put more uh, people uh, to gain uh, employment and therefore begin their own pathway into a better future. So, you know, it's a personal experience for me, as it is for Hamdi, to kind of come be displaced and, and have to figure things out. And as, as I grew up and I got an education, which, which in this country is the biggest gift that one gets when, when, when one gets here, I realized that I was comparatively more comfortable being uncomfortable than the people who grew up here. Hmm. Because I had already been uncomfortable. When I lived in Lebanon, <laughs> I'd seen buildings blow up right next to where I lived. I'd seen lots of people die at 13 years old. You don't forget that. That's not a television show. And so later on, when people are thinking, well, I'm going to struggle to have a business plan and people are, it's just a very different <laughs> level of struggle. I really mean it. And, and, and uh, you know, I realized this much later in my life. What I realized is that, and I will say this very kind of emphatically, 
innovation, which is the field that I'm in, is just intellectual immigration. And if you have the experience of physically, whether it's forcibly or otherwise, actually being displaced and trying to create a new reality, you should be far more open to the challenges and the struggle. And I think that's why you find a vast majority of immigrants in this country working in startups, working in kind of innovating. That's one thing to keep in mind. But also for the refugees in the world today, they are the substrate of what will drive that type of risk taking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things I've learned in my life, so the journey, you know, the human journey that a lot of folks go through is surviving, then reviving, which is a very different mindset, then striving, that's where the effort comes in, and then if you're lucky, thriving, and then hopefully helping others do that. Well, in that journey, what's going to propel you forward? Well, being pretty close to losing your life or losing your livelihood is a damn good motivator. So when I came to this country, I was told long ago, 50, 60 years ago now, that this is a melting pot. I must say those two words have stuck with me. If the whole world can accept refugees and immigrants and accept them as self, not as other, in fact, not overwhelmingly try to protect the minority status, but actually have them feel like the majority. I think then let them, that's reviving, let them then show the way of how new opportunity can be created and how risk is taken. And actually, I think it'll activate the local folks in doing the kinds of things that they may have lost the tradition to do because a few you know, decades ago or centuries ago, their, their ancestors came. So I think this connection between entrepreneurship, startups, and this regenerative power that comes from displacement, actually, is the kind of a bit of the good thing in an otherwise terrible thing, which is being forced out of your home. Wow, that's so profound. Um, and I, I want to be sure I get it straight. So it's surviving, reviving. Striving. Striving, and then and thriving. thriving. Yeah, thriving is a result. But I like where that. I think countries come in and communities come in is give a chance for survivors that failed to die, largely, to actually, for, for, through chance or through help of others, to revive, to kind of start establishing a new life. After that, I don't think they need a lot of help. Yeah, well, you know, I was reading uh, an article um, yesterday about one of the refugees who has been bused uh, to Washington under false pretenses, but ended up there, a young man from Venezuela, and he said, oh my gosh, there's so much work I can get here. And I thought, wow, that is exactly the attitude we want. And. It does drive me a little crazy when people uh, seem to uh, misunderstand the drive of somebody, as you're describing, uh, who wants to get out there and do the work and go as far as you know, hard work and talent uh, will take them. Secretary Clinton, I'll just say one thing. When I first came to this country, I, have, I, have, I was fortunate enough to go to MIT. MIT is filled with foreigners. I walked down this long corridor in 1983. I never forget this. I want to share it for people to imagine the moment. There was a picture of an Indian, a native Indian chief with a finger out to the person walking by saying, who are you calling foreigner, pilgrim? <laughs> and and I, that stuck with me. <laughs> who are we calling foreigner? Right? This is a country of foreigners. I like that. So for those who maybe didn't know much about the personal experience of Nubara Fayyam, now you probably understood that it's huge and uh, it means going through a crisis and uh, surviving and then uh, rebuilding, uh, starting again and bringing this uh, strength uh, worldwide. So, and there's another issue I want to talk to, with you uh, about. It's um, the, the, the difficulty of creating the global community of like-minded people uh, that the Aurora Initiative was able to do during uh, the past years. And so about this topic, I want to involve again uh, Nubara Feyan. Um, how could you do that? How could you build the global community? Well, first of all, I refuse to watch these types of things, and I think the organizers arranged this just to force me to watch. It's excruciatingly painful <laughs> to watch oneself, so I'm really sorry for having to put you, have you suffer as well. Um, look, I think um, we're trying to figure that out. I think that the, it is clearly the case that a lot of people are fighting these battles individually and there's nothing organized and systematic about 
that. Obviously, the UNHCR and other uh, extremely important uh, uh, international organizations bring support to them. But what enables these people to feel like they're going to succeed? Well, in an odd way, that's how entrepreneurs feel. Right? Every entrepreneur, every startup founder feels alone. They don't have a community. They don't have, and they feel like they have to wage this battle. And if you look over the last few years, there's been groupings of entrepreneurs, and more and more there's a community that gives you the courage and the conviction that your journey can succeed. You know, it's, I always think it's like, I obviously, given my body, I'm not a mountain climber, but I imagine what a mountain climber must feel like when they look at a mountain that's never been climbed. Never. How do you know you're going to be able to succeed? Well, if there's people there who have climbed similar mountains can tell you, these are what the things you have to watch for. And these are the, that kind of uh, a community of, of people who've had the experience, I think is extremely important. And I think that's a special role that Aurora can play, is this kind of dialogues, bringing this community together, giving them voice. So I think that's really, really important. The second thing is that they all share a lot in common, whether it's the motivation, the values, the determination, but above all, I'd say it is a future orientation. One of the things that keeps coming up in all these discussions is that when you're displaced, you are essentially not only uprooted, but you are unrooted, because you can't just go somewhere else and immediately have roots. So in that unrooted uh, period, one of the things you tend to do, this has been my experience, whether it's in startups, and you'd be amazed how similar it feels when you're struggling and you're gonna die and you're gonna lose everything you've worked for versus physically being in risk, you tend to have a different relationship with the future. All of a sudden your imagination kicks in and you imagine your ability to fit in and to succeed and to contribute to society. That imagination is the, the way in which I think most people make it through. And so this future orientation, this, this hope and conviction that the future can be what you want it to be is something else that they share. So bringing people together and helping them learn from each other how that future orientation propels them and drives them, very important mindset thing. So above the money, above the projects, above all the different things we can do, I think among the things we can do is really provide to otherwise lonely practitioners of a often accidental role, which is to save other people, finds a community of like-minded workers who then start believing that they're gonna make it, like Tom Katina, whose example I use, like Marguerite Barankitze, like Julien, who's here today. I remember last year her reaction, and I hope she can confirm it, that there's a little bit of a bump you get when you feel like, you know what, I'm not alone, and I can make this because these other people made it. And so I, we feel a special role in that. Whether it'll be helpful or not, time will tell, but we certainly think we can play that role. One more question for Nubara Afayan. Which are the advantages of the new approach of Aurora? And also, how do you see the future of Aurora now? You've been talking about the future before. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, so the, the future of Aurora is something that we're, um, on the one hand, careful not to prescribe too much because we want there to be a need for what we're doing instead of us having some grand vision that has no impact. So we're carefully trying to figure out which relationships with which entities and where is our involvement both unique and impactful. Because we can have impact, but it could be a drop in an ocean, or we can have impact in a way that's unique to what we can bring to bear and therefore is amplified. And so we are thinking about our future. We would like to make this activity a permanent activity if we can. For that, as we described last night, we are setting out to, to create an, an endowment fund uh, in, in, and dedicated to the legacy of our co-founder, Vartan Grigorian. And through those resources and, and quite a bit more that we're attracting every year to begin to grow activities and to create the permanence to this community, to the support, and to the mission. This whole notion of gratitude and action, you know, these are not words just for us. I would, I would propose to you that of the things that compel people to be kind to others or to provide charity, there are many things. One is you might do it because you're kind-hearted. It's really hard to do years and years and years of that just out of the kindness of your heart. It, you know, I find very, very few people manage that. They're, they're, they're great when they do. Another is that it might uh, increase your social image. You might do it because you feel others will think better of you if you're doing this. 
that also doesn't last very long. After a while, it saturates. Another is guilt. You know, when you see the news, when you see the, the constant reporting of, of, of struggle, you feel guilt. How long does guilt compel you to do things? A day, a week, a month? No. But gratitude, the feeling of indebtedness to the kindness of others who helped you, enable you, turns out that I believe anyway, it may be wrong, but I believe that is a self-replenishing feeling because you can express your gratitude to unsuspecting people who you do something good to, and look what you've done. One, you have paid a bit of your debt. The next day, you still feel gratitude because you were still helped by that. You don't satiate it. But two, you infect somebody else with that same feeling of gratitude because now they benefited from your help. And they have to go around saying, okay, I was lucky somebody helped me. Who can I help? So this notion of gratitude in action, I think, can be a more lasting, we hope, a more lasting human feeling that will generally direct people to do good instead of you know, pay back their debts and feel, feel like this is guilt-oriented. All of that are things we've been discovering and we'd like to find ways to resource in a way that will become permanent. And we're on our way to doing that. We, we, we are aspiring to, to, to pull together a pool of 50 million, potentially more, maybe up to 100 million in a few, in a few years. And we're, we're excited by the early uh, uh, support we're attracting. And, you know, this is all done to, to, to create a lasting uh, uh, um, way to support the, the, the people who need this 10, 20, 50 years from now, not just today. Many thanks. And let me involve again uh, Riccardo Clerici, uh, because the job of UNHCR is also unique. And also I would like to know more about what you think have been the, uh, the biggest challenges of this year uh, for uh, the UNHCR. The biggest challenge in 2022? <sighs> well, there are many, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, to keep the same level of engagement of international community of so many crises, that has been uh, uh, one of the key challenge. Our High Commissioner, uh, we just finished our uh, annual gathering, it's called XCOM in Geneva, and he started his intervention by saying that, uh, looking at the past, there were ways uh, in the so-called governance of international community in which uh, actors, parties, uh, member states did communicate, did try to find a solution, a compromise with all the constraints and all the challenges. The sense we have now with these uh, impressive numbers of displacement is that this dialogue is at stake. This dialogue is in peril and uh, our call is for the international community uh, to look at that for the way forward. And when I mean international community, the other remark that is very important for us to build, and it goes a little bit along the lines of um, Mr. Afeyan, it takes the commitment of what we call society as a whole, the role of uh, cultural institution, the role, the key role of private companies. We need to join forces. We have, you might know, the Global Compact, was launched four years ago. Uh, I hope you still rem remember that. We will have uh, next year a key milestone to see what was accomplished, what the pledges, and I think, Mr. Afeyan, maybe we can think about how this supportive network uh, could play a role and could feed into this uh, mechanism in which we will take stock of achievement. But private companies, uh, investment on uh, refugee skills, capacity potential, I think is one, we think, we believe, is one of the way forward. Conclude the challenge, once we agree among ourselves on that, is the narrative, the political, cultural narrative. I mean, the words at the Clinton event uh, were very inspiring, but I have to say that globally, but also in Italy, you know very well, Marti Marina, how to change the narrative and the people perception and understanding of how refugees can be a driving force, that's a daily, daily, daily challenge. And I will maybe copy, if I can have a copyright of some of your statements, because it's needed. You need to take it from different angles. And maybe the gratitude can be a key 
to move uh, people's conscience uh, uh, forward. Let me just add one thing, and I think in Italy and in other places, examples are going to matter, and I'll give the example I know mostly about. There were basically three companies involved in making vaccines that worked globally during this pandemic. In my case, I'm Armenian, came over as an immigrant, in fact, temporarily as a political refugee, and the CEO of the company is from France, first-generation immigrant. The company in Germany is led by two Kurdish Turks. The company Pfizer globally is led by Albert Borla, a Greek uh, a, a citizen who immigrated. You, you can exclude these people all you want, but there's, it's, this is not an accident. It's just one instance. If you look at Silicon Valley, 50% of the companies that are worth more than a billion dollars are founded and run by immigrants. You take them out. And so if for a country to want, and it is not that they are uniquely able to do this, but I believe more and more, like I said, that they're uniquely willing to take the risk and, and, and loss to reputation of doing it because of their life experience. So if people go to the camps in Jordan and see that there are people there who might actually create the next Uber or Duber or whatever company you want to have in your country, I would argue that that's a much higher likelihood that they're gonna come from that and the country will be better off for it. That's what, that's what I believe. And Mr. Nubarafayan, I, I will also be interested to know uh, what do you think about how the media have been covering uh, the recent uh, crisis, the ones that you mentioned as overlooked crisis, because the pandemic uh, was uh, also overshadowing uh, crisis in many areas of the world. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we have, we have David Ignatius here and others who are much better at being able to comment on the media. You, of course, I have to tell you in parentheses, just on a lighter note, that Marina, I met Marina last year, she interviewed me, and, and I was, I've always, I've not told her I'm taken by her name, because her name contains in the right order the letters MRNA. And I'm very <laughs> impressed at this, at this wonderful name that I've met somebody with the name Marina, because every time I see it, all I see is MRNA. Anyway, just as a joke. But to your more serious question, I think the media today is, is on the one hand struggling with what is fact-based and what is opinion and what is counterfactual, nevertheless being put forward as fact. That's one thing we all know. The other thing is that there's attention spans that are very, very short and so everything conflicts with each other. Yes, the pandemic made other big events seem less important, including in our own country, Armenia, where there was a war waged under the cover of the pandemic and the rest of the world didn't react at all because in part everybody was distracted. But oddly enough, the pandemic now is being displaced by wars and other things as an important issue. So people are declaring the pandemic over, you don't really need to take care of, protect yourself. So what comes around goes around, as they say, it's, it's really, you know, it, it's indiscriminate kind of the news indiscriminately shifts the focus. And I think anybody, as, as, as we heard uh, from Ricardo, the, the notion that we can get the narrative right, but also to have a message that's persistent, um, it's, that's a much worse challenge than making a new vaccine or helping <laughs> refugees. That's a whole nother ballgame. I don't have a good answer for that. Thank you, Nubara Fayana. I didn't know about my name. I had this uh, fantastic clue. And uh, thank you for this fantastic conversation. Thank you so much.